start all the classes with the same saying it's a special month, all the months are special. But from, uh, thank you so much, but from previous classes that we have, now we're actually closing a cycle, because if you remember, the first class we had about the month was Kislev, last year. So now we're actually closing a cycle, and we have 12 classes, one on each month, which of course we're not going to stop these classes. Next month we'll have another class about the month of Kislev with a different topic. But since we know that every month has a certain energy, we know every week has an energy, that's why our sages broke the Torah into parashot. The Torah is not written as parashot, the Torah is written with chapters, with prakim. And you'll see that in a parasha is different prakim, an actual a, a chapter. So later on came the separation of the parashot. One of the many reasons is because we have every week a certain energy. And, you know, we just read three weeks ago in Parashat Bereshit that there was a river that came out of Eden. We're talking about four rivers, but this, the, the Torah says, Venahar Yotzemi Eden, a river goes out of Eden, Lashkotet Agan, to water the garden. Later on, it's talking about the other four rivers that go out. Teachings of Hasidut explains that the river that is going out of Eden, Eden comes from the word metikut, something that is sweet. Eden is a very high level in the spiritual world. And it's going out of this level that is called Eden. What is the action? Lashkotet agan, to water the garden. Which garden is it talking about? Gan, you write it gimel nun. Gimel is the numerical value of 3, and Nun is the numerical value of 50. Together it makes 53. There are 53 parashot in the Torah. Mm. There's not 53 weeks in the, in the year, but there's 53 parashiot in the Torah. That's why when we have a leap year, you'll see that, the, that when, when there's not a leap year, I'm sorry, we read sometimes two parashot together. We read Matot, Matot, eh, Matot Masai and so forth, and there's different parashot that we read together. So, when the Torah says that the river goes out, Lashkotet Agan, is the river, is the concept of Hamshacha, uh, some type of an energy that's coming from one place to another. So a certain energy is coming from this level that is called Eden, to water the garden, means to nourish the 53 parashiot of the Torah. So we know that every week there's a certain energy. And if I'm reading the parasha of Lech Lecha, there's an energy that belongs to that week. Since we're now learning about the month, so we know that every month has a certain energy. Not only that the month has a certain energy, it has a character trait. We know we, just, we already should be familiar. We say that every month there's a star that is controlling the month. The energy comes from the star. There's a, 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 a sense that belongs to the month. We talked about the 12 senses. Every month has a connection to one of the tribes. So we have many different connections to the month. So we want to learn what is the energy that is more available, available in this month. So in the month of Tishrei, there's one energy. The month of Kislev. Every month is a completely different energy. If I know how to fine tune to the energy of the universe, then I will benefit from it. Like in the olden days, if you remember the radio, had a dial. Remember those radios that you went like this? And now it's all digital. But when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I wanted to hear the radio. I had to turn the dial, and if I'm not 100% on the station, I would have this uh, static. Then I had to move the radio like this and like that, and bend the antenna to different. Uh, so some of you nodding, you know what I'm talking about. So the same way that I had to move the dial till I got the precise uh, dots of the station. Same thing here. How did I get the music from the radio? Because some genius found out that there's frequencies in the air that if I transmit a certain frequency or some information through a frequency, another person that will dial on the frequency will be able to pick up the radio waves. That's the radio. Because if I'm transmitting from one place through a radio wave, if you focus on the same frequency, you'll be able to hear what I'm saying. This is the invention of radio. Same thing here. There is a certain energy that is coming down to the universe. 
If I know how to fine-tune myself to the energy, I will be able to receive what the other side is transmitting. And this is why we're doing this class every month, because I want to fine-tune to the energy of the month. So we know in Tishrei, of course, needless to say, one of the, the dominating part is the Tishrei um, uh, month of Tshuva, the month of rejuvenation and so forth. But now comes this month, that even in his name, in the name of the month, is already eh, telling me bad news. I mean, we call the month Cheshvan, but the month is called Mar Cheshvan. Now Mar, you can also translate it as Mr. Mr. Cheshvan. But Mar comes because Mar is a Mr. You know, you have Mrs. and, uh, and Mr. So Mr., you know how when you, you, you write Mr. M-R, Mrs. M-S, Mr. Anava, so, Mar, that's the Mr. in Hebrew, Mar. Mar Cohen, whatever it is. So, it's funny because, you know, sometimes when you book an air ticket on an airline, they, you have, you can mark it as Mr., Doctor, whatever. The only airline in the world, Il Al, they also have Rabbi. Oh. They have Doctor, oh. Mr., Mrs., they have Rabbi. Oh. So, I was, <laughs> so, it's just funny. But anyways, Mar is bitter. Now that's already sounds like bad news. What you're telling me now? I'm going to have a bitter month. So the mar doesn't come from the word in Hebrew merirut, which is bitter. But we're going to learn soon why dafka the mar. What's the point of the merirut of the bitterness? Now every month we mention, based on the teachings of the Book of Formation, Sefer Yetzirah, that is attributed to Avraham Avinu even though the, we know that the information came from Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon was the first Mekubal, because he got it from Hashem. He passed it down to Shem, to Hanoch, all the different generations, and it eventually got to Avraham Avinu, the information. And Avraham Avinu compiled the book, so that's why we're, we're, we're relating the book to Avraham Avinu. But this is called Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation. And the Book of Formation says that there are two main powers that the control the month, govern the month, affect the month. And based on the teachings of Sefer Yetzirah, each one of these powers, they come in, a, in through a form of a letter. So the letter, the first letter that is affecting the month of Cheshban is the letter Nun. Now the letter creates a sign. You know, we know that Cheshban, is a, the, the sign is Scorpio. Uh, Tishrei is a uh, Libra, the 12 signs. This is not the astrologist invented that. This is from Sefer Yetzirah. So the letter Nun, we're not going to explain now why Dafka specifically the letters, but the letters are tools, are vessels that the Kadosh Baruch Hu is using to create the world. And he used 22 v v vessels, 22 sophisticated tools. Like you go now to a dentist, dentist it looks like prehistoric tools these hammers and all these scary tools that they dig into your tooth, you would expect the dentist to have some uh, advanced tools, maybe some lasers, but they still bang into your tooth with hammers and, and needles. So Shem uses tools the same way that you see a sculpture or an artist. You know that some artists, they paint paintings, they don't paint it with a brush. They have like this little tool and they kind of like smear the, the paint. So an artist has tools, a carpenter has tools, everybody has tools. So Hashem has tools too. If I'm a carpenter, I need a saw, and I need something that, uh, you know, sandpaper, and I have all sorts of tools. I don't know the names, but I have, they have a lot of tools. Hashem has tools too. And the tools that Hashem uses are the letters that we know of, the alphabet of the Jewish language, of the holy a uh, uh, Hebrew language, not Jewish, Hebrew language, Lashon Kodesh. So the letter that Hashem used to create, or to, not to create, rather to govern and control and to influence the month of Cheshvan is the letter Nun. The letter Nun creates the sign that is called Scorpio. We call it in Hebrew Akrav. Now the Nun is not such a great letter. Because the Nun, if you notice, there's two types of Nuns. There are five letters, Mansapach, that, that they, they have a regular one, and then they have an end one. 
like a mem, it has a regular mem and then a men sofit. And nun has a regular nun and a nun sofit, an n nun. So we have a bunch of them. So nun is not such a great letter because the last letter of the nun, it goes down and it goes under the line. There are very few letters that go under the line. We have some letters that go above the line, which represents something positive. But a letter that goes under, that's not so good because it represents falling. And nun also represents falling. That's why the word falling in Hebrew is nefila. When I fall, I say in Hebrew nefila. So the nun represents something that is falling. This is already coming to signify something not so positive. Now what really happens when I fall? I fall into bitterness or anger, depression, uh, you know, all these things. If I fall in my level of spirituality or my physical, if I fall down physically, it will hurt. I will injure myself. I don't know anybody that fell and jumped up. Wow, I'm healed because I fell. Usually the falling will represent something negative. And now if it's spiritual and emotional, we have also a term in the spiritual language to say, Ashley Nefila, I fell down from my level. That's what it's talking about Adam Arishon. He was in a very high level, Venafal mi Madrigato. And he fell from his level. So the noon represents the Nefila, the falling, and the falling represents bitterness, sadness, depression, anger, all these bad qualities. Now you can be a very, a very negative person and see the Nefila as something negative, so the falling, the tripping. Or you can look at it as something very positive, because after the falling, there's rising up. And usually when you fall, I mean, some people stay down. The nature is that after you fall, you get up. And the getting up, that's a very positive thing. So to get up from something low, takes much more powers and energy to get up. So one can look at it as something very bitter, and that the month is not such a great month. But wait, don't jump uh, right away to conclusion. The noon can actually represent a very positive thing. Then the book of formation, Sefer Yetzirah, comes with another information, and it says the second letter that the month is being uh, controlled and used by is the letter Dalet. The letter Dalet, it comes to represent also something very negative, because the word uh, uh, deficiency in Hebrew is dalut, something that doesn't have anything. In Hebrew it's called dal, I don't have anything. This is a deficiency. This is representing uh, something, a lack of something. More than that, the planet, there is a planet for every month, there's one planet that controls the month. All the months except two are sharing a planet. The month of Tammuz and the month of Av, they don't share a planet. The month of Tammuz is controlled by the moon and the month of Av is controlled by the sun. All the rest of the, 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 the months are sharing a planet. The month of uh, Cheshvan is controlled by Mars. Now Mars also seems like a very bad <laughs> planet. Fiery planet, a lot of judgments, a lot of gvurot. When Mars is in control, uh, maybe you notice in some congregation, you will notice it very soon when we're moving the clocks. Some congregations, some uh, people, they will not do Kiddush on Friday between quarter to six to quarter to seven. Because that's the time when the planet Mars is in control. And the planet Mars has a lot of dinim, comes from the attribute of Gvura. And since I'm doing Kiddush on red wine, it's much more uh, respectable to do Kiddush on red wine. White wine is not considered wine. It's considered a, what's called a yain saraf. That it's wine, but it's not really wine. The real wine is red wine. And I have to do Kiddush on red wine. Since I'm doing the Kiddush on red wine, and the, one, the red, one of the reasons why I do on the red wine is to sweeten the judgments. And if I'm going to do Kiddush while the judgments are being empowered, that can actually severely hurt me. So this is of course teachings of Kabbalah. Many people don't go by that. They'll do, uh, they'll do Kiddush. But some people, they do follow the teachings of the Kabbalah. They will not do Kiddush between quarter to six to quarter to seven in the evening when it falls on in the winter. So Mars, also we have this connotation of a very fiery planet that's actually called the planet of war. So again, we're meeting two letters that seems very negative. 
that if you put them together even, the Dalet and the Nun, this is done. Judging. Dinim. Again. Against with his judgments. So again, and not only that, the, uh, the sign that is representing the month is a deadly, deadly animal. A Scorpio is a very deadly animal. It's actually the, one of the only animals that is a danger to itself. You know, sometimes the Scorpios, they, they sting themselves because they have it from above. And sometimes, and they're probably not such an intelligent animal, they sting themselves and they die. But a Scorpio? Yeah. Yeah, they kill themselves 100%. When they feel they're, they're in danger or that they're going to be... Uh, they have, it's an animal with a lot of pride. And if they see that their uh, enemy will kill them, they kill themselves. They're like, I'll kill myself, just don't let you kill me. So it's a very dangerous animal. Their venom is a, is a very, very uh, uh, strong venom. It's actually interesting because we're going to read down the line in the parashot about how they threw Yosef into the pit. It says that the pit had snakes and scorpions. We, we interpret that, that the snakes, they have venom and the scorpions have venom. Just that a snake has hot venom and a scorpio has cold venom. And that's, that's, their, that's how it is. And the snake represents the venom, the, the poison that goes into my body in a, in a warmth to excite me to do a sin. But the scorpio is the type of poison, the venom that comes into my body to cool me down. That I don't want to do any mitzvah. That I don't want to be charitable and kind and nice. It's a much more deadlier venom. To have excitement for something good, use that excitement to serve Hashem. But sometimes we use the excitement to do a sin. The venom of a scorpio is a cold venom. It cold, numbs you down, makes you cold. Cold to Hashem. And, for, and, and not only that, call to other people, but makes you call and numb to Yavodat Hashem. So Scorpion, we see also, we have a planet as a planet of war. We have the, the letter Nun that represents the, the, the sign, negative letter. The animal, the, the sign itself is a very dangerous and deadly animal. This looks like a very depressing one. But, when they asked Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Zohar, what is the purpose of human beings? Why Hashem created the world? Why? I'm here. Seven billion people and generations over generations and we're all suffering and, and sometimes we don't suffer. Sometimes we have good times and bad times. And Why are we suffering here? Why are we here? Why are we here? When they asked Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he answered very short. He said, Litkafia sitra acha. I was created to subdue the other side of holiness. This is it. An Olympic game. I'm in a ring and I have to uh, win the, my opponent. Itkafia means to subdue. Sitracha is the other side of holiness. That's, this, that's what he says. Lekach no tzarta. This is what you were created for. Hashem is going to put a challenge in you and you have to overpower it. That's it. Now what would be the result? It says in the Zohar, after I do itkafia sitracha, the result will be hithapcha chashocha lenehora. Transforming the darkness into light. And then he continues and he says something very interesting. And transforming the bitterness into sweet. If I'm able to do, to sweet, the bitterness into sweet. Meriru is resembled the words in Hebrew, marir, mar. Like you have the dark chocolate, it's called chocolate marir. And metiku resembles the word in Hebrew. It's, of course, it's Aramaic. It resembles the word in Hebrew, matok, sweet. Now, if I'm able to overcome my challenge, doesn't matter what the challenge is, then I'm transforming the darkness into light. Three weeks ago, it should be fresh in our mind. Hashem created the world. What is the first thing that represents the world? The land was a chaos. Darkness. And right away, by Hashem Ra at Hashem, by Yehi Or, Hashem saw the light. Ooh, I like the light. By Yar Hashem Kitov, Hashem said, Ooh, I like this light. So we see that the whole concept of the world, that it started with darkness. And then came the creation to transform the darkness into light. 
When it says the word Vayehi Or, it means that the light was already created. Hashem didn't create the light. The light was already created. He just revealed the light. The light was created before the first day. There are seven things that were created before the first day. And one of them is the light. One of them is the name of Mashiach. There's different things. But one of them is the light. That light. This is not the light that we see from the sun. This light right away, Hashem concealed it. This is not the light. I mean, the sun was created on the fourth day. That light that we're talking about here, Hashem saw, Vayar Hashem Kitov. Hashem saw that light is good. Umiyad Ganzolat Tzadikim. Right away, He concealed it. He put it away for the time when Mashiach is going to come. That's when we're going to see that light. This is called the Ora Ganuz, the concealed light. Hashem was afraid that the wicked people will use it or damage it. This is not the light that we see. We are affected by the light of the sun that was created on the fourth day. So we see right away that the concept of the world was to transform the darkness into light. The analogy one can understand, what does it mean to transform the darkness into light? In order for Hashem to cover the godly light, He created an energy. That energy is being pulled from the attribute that is called Gvura. Timtum, din, a judgment, a, a cover. This energy manifests into a different level of an energy that is called klipa, a husk. Klipa is like a shell, something that covers it. So the original klipa is a good thing. It's covering the light. It's concealing the light in order to be able to have a creation in the world. Later on, of course, the klipa was manifested into another level, to another level. That in this generation, the klipa is evil coming against us. But the analogy one can understand, imagine my, uh, uh, you know, my daughter, I have a four-year-old girl and she likes these devices that you put soap and water and you, you blow in it and bubbles come out and then all the room is full of bubbles. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's one of her favorite toys. And we mix it with water and soap she has a stick with a hole, and she knows how to blow through it, and a lot of bubbles come out. Yeah, what did I say, salt? No, soap. Maybe I by mistake said salt. You put soap. But she has a big problem. She has a six-year-old brother that comes and, and he blows them away. And she gets very upset. Why are you blowing my bubbles? So then, of course, we have a, a whole hour of fight. He's blowing the bubbles, I'm doing the bubbles, stop doing the bubbles, leave the bubbles. So, the analogy here is, you know, when you blow the bubble, what creates the bubble? Air. Either, well, you said air, what, what creates the bubble? The, the soap, the soap and the water, not the air. The soap and the, the water is around, and I'm just <laughs> blowing air in it, so it bloop, so now I have air, and around it I have the soap and the water. But if I pop it, then the water and the soap falls on the ground and the air is released. This is transforming the darkness into light. The light that Hashem created is covered like in bubbles. All the universe is full of bubbles. And for the sake of the argument right now, we're going to take the side of the six-year-old that pops the bubbles. So Hashem says, all the light is here concealed in these bubbles, pop them. How do you pop them? You have to go through a challenge. You're going to go through a challenge and if you overpower the challenge, you will pop a bubble and you transform the darkness into light and voila, vayahi o. One of the first things, the first commandments in the world, in the universe, and there should be light. The light was already there. I didn't create the light, I'm just revealing it. This is what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, that I'm transforming the darkness into light. But more than that, I'm transforming the bitterness into sweet. And this is why we have the challenges. And you can look at the month of Cheshvan as a very negative month. Mar Cheshvan, bitterness. The letter Nun represents me falling. The letter Dalet, the Dinim, Mars, Scorpio. One can get into a confusion and say, this is a depressing month. Such a depressing month that I don't even have one holiday in this month. You know that almost every holiday, every month has at least an event. If not a holiday, then an event. So Av is not necessarily such an amazing month, but there's an event. It's Tisha Be'Av, Tu Be'Av. There's something going on. Almost every month has something. Even in Yav, so I have like Ba'omer. Cheshvan is like a 
Empty month. I don't even have, forget about a holiday. I don't even have an event. Nothing big happened in history. The only thing, big thing that happened in history in Cheshvan is the flood. And that's also bad news. So in essence, you can look at it in a very different way and say that Cheshvan is a very negative month, but it's not. Now, in the previous classes, we kind of talked more in the direction of the sense of the month. Today, I want to talk more in the sense in regards to the tribe of the month. The tribe of the month is a very unique tribe. It's the tribe of Menashe. Menashe is a very unique tribe, a very unique child. It's a child of Yosef, which already arouses the question, how is he one of the tribes? How is Ephraim and Menashe came into the tribes suddenly? But Menashe is the, month, is the tribe of the month. Right from the beginning, we have to analyze that the name of Menashe has the same letters of the word neshama, soul. That in itself already is already representing something more deep. The sense of the month of uh, Cheshvan is the sense of smell, which is a very refined sense. If you remember last couple months, we talked about the sense of seeing, sense of hearing, the sense of touching. But the month, the sense of the month of Cheshvan is the sense of smell, smell, which already, again, it's connected to the Neshama. The only way how the Neshama can feel pleasure in this world from something physical is from smell. That's why we smell things on Motzei Shabbat. That's why we smell Besamim. We're appeasing the Neshama. We're allowing it to have some pleasure. I don't know if you remember one of the classes I told you that the Arizal says one of the ways of strengthening my emunah, my belief, is to smell good things. And to say a bracha, of course. And the benefit that I'm getting from smell is a very unique benefit. From food, I get a very good benefit. I have to eat it all the time. But food also has uh, garbage. It has uh, excrement. Something comes out. That's why I, on the, when I eat food, I say a first bracha. And after I eat the food, I say a second bracha, an after bracha. The first bracha is to release the spark out of the food, the godly spark. The second bracha is to be allow the toxins to come out of the body. If you're suffering chas v'shalom for any sickness, start paying attention for saying your after brachas. Because if you don't say an after bracha, it doesn't allow the toxins to come out of the body. That's why we say an after bracha, by the way. But when we smell something, bore mine besamim, bore isbe besamim, there's no after bracha. There's no toxins. I get 100% of benefit here. So we see already a connection between the month of Menashe, the word of Neshama, the same letters. Neshama is my soul. The sense is the sense of smelling. The Neshama, where does the Neshama come to the body? We just read it, should be... Yeah, it should be uh, fresh in our mind. When Hashem created Adam Arijon, He, he made the... Uh, took sand, from all corners of the world, he brought some heavenly dew, make it like, a, like when we were little kids, we made these balls, and after he formed the body, he says, and he blew through his nose a living soul. So again, the soul and the nose has a very big connection. Also, now, Who said that? I said that? No. When a person dies, he dies. Nothing, nothing stays. No, I mean, the sense of smell stays for a while. From, by the neshama? Or the people who are uh, the, the family? See, also in Iran, uh, the customer, when a person dies, they put like um, a bottle of uh, perfume or something. Oh, that's for the neshama, not the body. Once the body is dead, it's dead. You're right, they put it for the neshama. Because the neshama can smell. You know, very soon Mashiach is going to come. It says Mashiach, his power is going to be, he's going to smell. He's go Mashiach's power will be through smell. He's going to judge everybody through their smell. He's going to smell you. He's going to sniff you. And he will know everything about you. So better take a shower. <laughs> Before Mashiach comes, and we're going to get some deodorants. So it's not going to be like, I'm sorry, it's very distracting. I'm very sorry. <laughs> so, back to our topic. Menashe is the older brother of Ephraim. But, for whatever reason, 
Ephraim is always put first. Even in the month, the month of Tishrei, this, the tribe of the month of Tishrei is Ephraim. For whatever odd reason, Menashe is the oldest, but he always comes after Ephraim. So we see that in the month of uh, Tishrei is Ephraim, then comes Menashe. Now, we know that the world, there's two opinions when the world was created. One opinion says uh, in Nisan, one opinion says in uh, Tishrei. There's a machloket in the Gemara between Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Yuda. But there's no machloket here because the spiritual part of the year, the, the, of, the, of the world, the neshama of the world was created in Nisan. And the body of the world, the physicality was created in Tishrei. Really the first month of the year, the biblical month of the year is Nisan, is the first month. Tishrei is not the first month. That's why we call Rosh Hashanah Rosh Hashanah and not Chilat Hashanah. We don't call it the beginning of the year. We call it the head of the year. So if we're counting the biblical months, then Cheshvan will be the eighth month, right? Even in the Torah, when it's talking about the holiday of Rosh Hashanah and the holiday of Yom Kippur, it says Bachodesh Hashvi'i, in the seventh month. So Cheshvan is the eighth month. How do you say and write eight in Hebrew? You say Shmone, and you write it with the same letters of Menashe, and the same letters of Neshama. So Menashe, we already see already another hint how Menashe falls on the eighth month of Cheshvan. Now, again, another amazing uh, connection. When they inaugurated the tabernacle, what's called Chanukat HaMizbeach, every day, one president from one tribe brought his offering. Ephraim was giving his offer on the seventh day, and Menashe gave his offering on the eighth day. Again, we see that Ephraim goes before Menashe, but again, we see that Menashe is holding the, the number eight, which eight Bechlal represents above nature, above this world. Now, Menashe is the older boy, even when Yaakov came to give them a blessing, you remember? He mixed his hands. He put the right hand on, on Ephraim. Instead of putting the right hand on Menashe, he puts the right hand on Ephraim and the left hand on Menashe. And Yaakov was like, uh, and Yosef was telling him, Abba, uh, this is Lamatim, he's the older one. And Yaakov says, no, you're right. Menashe is the older one. But Ephraim is going to be greater than him. He's going to grow to become much, much greater than Menashe. That it's even said in the Torah that Ephraim is going to grow, he's going to be a father of many, many goyim, many, many nations. And that's why he's going to get the blessings first. I mean, there is a group of people, we're not going to talk about it today, it's off the subject, but there is a group of people, non-Jews, that they consider themselves the Bnei Ephraim, <coughs> They have a uh, Ephraimites, I don't know how they sp pronounce it in English. Uh, they call themselves Bnei Ephraim, the sons of Ephraim. Because in the Torah it says that Ephraim, his seed, his sperm, is going to be for many, he's going to be a father of many, many nations. And it doesn't say nations, it says Goim, Male Goim. So, uh, I mean, unfortunately they're not doing it the right way. They're not going in the path of the Torah. They still... Uh, throw in it, Christianity and Yashka and all the rest of the stuff, so they're missing the point. The, the idea is right, but there is Bnei Ephraim, but it's not the ones, it's a group that they, they, they it's like a wolf in the in a clothes of a lamb, yeah. pretending to be Jewish and pretending to believe in the Torah, but really they distort it and their essence, their belief is again in Christianity. But this is off the subject, we're not going to talk about it today. Bye. When Yaakov gave the bracha to Ephraim, first of all he gave the bracha to Ephraim, and he says he's going to be greater than Menashe, but when he gave the bracha to Menashe, it says, uh, when he gave both of them Menashe, it says, Vehem revavot Ephraim, Vehem alfei Menashe. Alfei means thousands, and revavot means tens of thousands. This is the bracha that Moshe Rabbeinu gave Ephraim and Menashe. It should be fresh in our mind because we just read it now in Simchat Torah. If you remember the verse, Moshe Rabbeinu gave also blessings to the, to the tribes. So Moshe says, Ephraim, Vehem revavot Ephraim. Ephraim is going to multiply in tens of thousands. Vehem alfei Menashe. And these are going to be the thousands coming out of Menashe. So we see 
that for whatever odd reason, Menashe is the older one and should be more important, but he's always pushed to be the second. Now, kind of to dissect the book of Bereshit, because the book of Bereshit has a lot of history in it. The book of Shmot already has the story of Yetziat Mitzrayim and the giving of the Torah and many halachot. The book of Kaikra is full of laws. So the book of Bereshit has a lot of stories, a lot of history. One dominating thing that we see in the book of Bereshit is a lot of fighting between brothers. Starting with Cain and Hevel. Yeah. First fight between brothers. Who wins? The younger one. Then fight between the sons of Noach. Shem and Yefet go against Ham. Ham wanted to, he did some bad things to Noach. Shem and Yefet, they go against him. Then Yitzchak and Ishmael. Who overpowers? Who wins? The younger one, or Hashem. But we see a fight between Yitzchak and Ishmael. And then Yaakov and Esav, another fight. And then Yosef and his brothers. The entire book is fighting. Brothers are fighting with brothers. The, the younger one against the older ones. When it was Yosef, Yosef was the younger one. There wasn't Binyamin yet. He was fighting the older ones. Yitzchak and Esav. Esav was the older one. The younger one was, had to fight. Again, same here with Yitzchak and Ishmael. And the whole book is fighting between brothers. Now, Yaakov Avinu, for whatever reason, was persistent that the small one, the younger one, the second one, has to go before the first, when he gave the blessing. Now, if you notice that the only brothers that there isn't any fight in the book of uh, Bereshit is between Ephraim and Menashe. There's no fight between them. Everybody else were fighting for the power for status, for the attention from the father. Ephraim and Menashe, there's no fighting at all. Ephraim constantly was pushed forward. Menashe, Bakasha, go ahead. Later on, we see another relationship between brothers that there's no fighting, but we see it already in the book of Shmot. And that's between Moshe and Aaron. There was a lot of respect between them. To a point that Moshe refused to be the redeemer because his brother is older than him. When Moshe Rabbeinu was debating with Hashem in the sneh, in the burning bush, Moshe Rabbeinu, he said, I can't do it. My brother is older than me. You give him. He has to, he has to get the respect. When Moshe and Aaron would go into the old moed, to the tent, they would fight. Who should get the honor? No, no, you should get it. No, you should get it. When Moshe Rabbeinu came down to Mitzrayim and told everybody he's the redeemer, you think Aaron started crying or started fighting with him? He was so proud. He's like telling him, you are the best man for the job. I'm so proud my young brother is going to be the redeemer. So we see a, a, a nice connection between Moshe and Aaron and Menashe and Ephraim. Because in many places in the Torah and the Tanakh, we see brothers are fighting. So we learn from that something very, very special. Menashe has a very powerful attribute in his soul. And this is the attribute that he's, he doesn't mind being the second one. He actually admits when somebody's better, he admits, it's okay, you're better than me. This is a very unique attribute that most people don't have. I have to be number one. And if I'm the older brother, so much more so I have to be number one. Whether it's Ishmael, whether it's Esav, whether it's the older brothers of Yosef, Menashe was the first one who had this dominating attribute in his neshama. A, I don't need to be number one. If you better than me, bakasha. This is called the power of admitting, hoda'a. I admit, you're better than me. No ego. When I have an ego, I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you. When I don't have an ego, you're smarter than me, you're better than me, you're more successful than me. Bakasha, go ahead. What does David HaMelech says? Kol neshama tehalel ya. Right? We say that every day. What does it mean kol neshama? All the soul who praise Hashem. Again, we're mentioning the name Neshama, same letters of Menashe. Menashe was the only, the first one, you can say, that was praising Hashem with his entire might. There was an ego here. There wasn't the fact of like, why not me? I, I, I'm, the, I'm the Bechor, I'm the first one. I, why am I getting the second blessing? Why am I I'm always second in line? Akasha, go ahead. So, 
There's difference of opinion. But one opinion says that this verse is talking about Menashe. That Menashe was happy with what he has. This is called a Sameach Bechelko. I'm getting second. Good. At least I got. This is a very powerful character trait. That later on, I mean, this is not necessarily the whole topic of what we're talking about. This in itself is enough. If you take that from this class to apply in this month, that is enough. To be able to be thankful for what you have. To be able to be so grateful with the little that you have. There's a Mishnah that says, Ezra Sameach, Ezra Ashir, Sameach Bechelko. Who's the rich person? The one that's happy with his portion. This is a very unique character trait. Now we, if you remember, we talked about it once. We're taking it to the next level. The Mishnah can be read in a different way. It depends where you put the comma. So you can read the Mishnah, Ezra Ashir Sameach Bechelko. Who is a rich person who's happy with, what his, what, with his portion? But we added another word, and I mentioned, Ezra Ashir, who's the rich person? Hasameach Bechelko Shel Chavero. He's happy in the portion of his friend. That's really what the Mishnah wants to tell me. Who is the real happy and rich person? Is not only that I'm happy with my portion. No complaints. But I'm happy with the portion of my friend. So when my friend has a beautiful car, enjoy it. He has a beautiful house, successful business, successful kid. I'm happy for him. I'm not putting a, a pickle face. Why he has it, not me. This is Menashe. And when David Amalek says, Kol neshama ta'alelia, the only one who can really praise Hashem is the, is, is the level of Menashe. That I'm happy. So what if you have more money? You have nicer clothes, nicer house, more kids. Doesn't matter. I have to be happy with my portion because that's what Hashem wants to give me. And I have to be happy with your portion. And not to be, you know, in Hebrew there's a word, I don't know the word, I never find the word in English. In Hebrew we say lefargen. I don't know if there even if there's such a word in English. Lefargen, I mean in English you say good for you, but it sounds very fake when you say good for you. It sounds like in other words I'm saying I'm jealous of you. When you say good for you. Lefargen is when I'm like, wow, you are you did amazing. You're so great in what you do and you're successful and I and I and I have respect and honor for you. It's very hard to I never found such a word in English what it means lefargen. It's to really compliment somebody, but genuinely. So Menashe had the, the power of looking at his portion and, and being thankful for what he has, and not only that, to praise somebody else. This in itself is something that we can uh, uh, focus on and to understand that this, this is part of the energy of the month. That's why the, enemy, uh, the, the energy of the month seems so negative. Because when I'm looking at somebody else and I'm jealous, I develop jealousy, First of all, jealousy is a sin. It's a sin. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Lot I'm not allowed to be jealous. It's not just an attribute. It's actually a sin. What, you're not happy with what Hashem gave you? That's chutzpah. How dare you not be happy with what Hashem gave you? And why you think that the grass of the neighbor is more green, it means he has a better life? But unfortunately, we humans, and we have this attribute of jealousy. Why him? Why she's more successful? How come she got married before me? How come she has this and that? It's a very bad attribute. And it seems bitterness. What is jealousy? It brings you into bitterness. Sometimes you see somebody else's success. Why are they building such a big house? What? They, they can't build a small house. So the jealousy brings you into a level of bitterness. That's why, again, corresponding to the month of Mark Hashvan, the bitterness, it's not. You can make it bitter. You can transform it into something sweet. How you transform it? By, first of all, you have to be happy with your portion. And not only be happy with your portion, be happy for somebody else's portion. Now quickly we just want to cover why is Ephraim always in the head? Why Menashe was pushed to the side? Menashe, by the way, just that you know, one of the reasons why he was named Menashe, because in Hebrew, the secondary is called Mishneh. Right? The second to the king is Mishneh Lamelech. Even in here in the Israeli army, you have a colonel. This is a, uh, 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 yeah, a general. is aluf. They have a general. Aluf Mishneh. It's the second to him. So Menashe, by the way, was the second to the king. He was the oldest. He was the second to the king, Yosef. Yosef was the king. 
Menashe was the firstborn, he was Mishneh Lamelech. I mean, when you're looking at this is not some uh, 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 <coughs> farmer. He was the second to the king of Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is like a, it's like a United States, it's like a Russia, it's like an empire. This is not some uh, dinky country in, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And Menashe was the second to the king. Where, how come Ephraim pushed him over? For whatever reason, we're not going to talk about that because it has more of a mystical explanation, but Yaakov Avinu, for whatever reason, had some type of a sensitivity and he liked always the younger one. That's why he liked Yosef the most. Now, the reason why ya Yaakov had some type of a sensitivity to Yosef because Yaakov, Yaakov is the, represents the Sfirah of Tiferet. And if you're counting from the Sfirot, the Chesed, the Gvura and the Tiferet, Chesed corresponds to Abraham Avinu, Gvura corresponds to Yitzchak, and Tiferet is Yaakov. In order for Tiferet, for the Sfirah of Tiferet, to connect to the Malchut, to the Shechina, it needed the, the entire Ziranpin, the entire six, all six Midot to be aligned. The last Sfirah that connects the entire six Sfirot, to the Malchut is the sphere of Yisod. Yosef was the sphere of Yisod. So Yaakov needed Yosef. When Yosef disappeared, you think Yaakov didn't know what happened? He's a prophet. He didn't know. He knew he's alive. The reason why he was mourning, because he didn't have the sphere of Yisod next to him, so he didn't have how to connect to the Shekhinah. He didn't have any c connection, a binding to the level, to the Sfirah of Malchut, so he didn't have a connection to the Shekhinah. So 17 years he was mourning. He was mourning that he doesn't have connection to the Shekhinah. He knew where Yosef is. He knew that divine providence took Yosef because Yosef had to lay the ground in Mitzrayim. When Yosef, Yaakov was a prophet. He got the prophecy also from Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu knew that we're going to be in Mitzrayim. It was all predestined. The reason why Yaakov was in mourning because he didn't have connection to the Shekhinah. So for whatever reason, we're not going to dissect it too much. Now, Yaakov had some type of a sensitivity to the Ben Zkunim, to the younger one. So he liked the Ephraim more. When Yaakov Avinu came to Mitzrayim and he saw these two boys, he asked Yosef, who are these boys? He told him, these are my sons. And when he came to bless them, he went the other around. And Yosef was trying to move his hands. Yaakov was like, no, 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 he's getting the blessing first. So for whatever reason, Yaakov had some type of a sense that he liked the younger one. In Hebrew, it's called Ben Zkunim. Now, <clears throat> when Yaakov gave them the blessing, Yaakov, of course, is a prophet. He's one of our forefathers. He didn't look at the body. He looked at the neshama. He looked in a completely different level. And when he looked in the neshama, the root of the neshama of Ephraim, he saw that Ephraim is going to be a greater leader. That from Ephraim came the leader, Yoshua, that came and took after Moshe Rabbeinu. He, excuse me. He took the Jews and led them into Eretz Israel. When Yaakov looked into the Neshama of Menashe, he saw that Menashe is also going to be a good leader, but no great leaders are going to come out of Menashe. The only great person that came out of Menashe was a judge called Gidon. So he says, okay, even though it's a judge, a righteous judge, it's not a great leader. It's something very temporary and small. So. That's how Yaakov Avinu made his calculation. Besides that we know that every generation has a leader, a spiritual leader. We call it the president, the Nasi of the door. Nasi, I mean president is not the right translation. So we'll call it now uh, a leader of the generation. There's always a Moshe Rabbeinu in the generation. And more than that, that after the destruction of the second temple, there was always the potential one that if Mashiach should come, he will be the Mashiach. So every generation have a, has a Nasi. We call it Nasi. Again, the translation will be president, but president is not the right way to translate it. The reason why I'm saying and repeating the word Nasi, because Nasi is the acronym of Nitzotz Shel Yaakov Avinu. A spark of Yaakov Avinu. This is the acronym. Nun for Nitzotz, the, the Sin for Shel, the Shin, Sin, same one. Yaakov is the Yud, and Avinu is the, the Lafs Aleph. If you remember, the Torah says that Yaakov Avinu Afam Lomet. Yaakov Avinu never died. What do you mean he never died? We buried him. 
We schlepped him all the way up to, to Marat HaMachpelah. What are you talking about? The whole parasha is talking about how Yaakov Avinu died and Yosef got a special permission to, from Paro to leave Mitzrayim and they made a whole entourage. Oh, half of the parasha is talking about. What are you talking about? He didn't die. Well, we have a, a grave. He didn't die because the spark of Yaakov Avinu is remaining in each and every generation. It says, Ma zar'o b'chaim? Kachu b'chaim. As long as his zera, his offsprings, his generations are alive, he's alive. And Yaakov is the father of all nations. I mean, in the beginning he was called Yaakov, then we changed his name to Israel. We are the sons of Israel. I mean, now we're called Jews. We're called Jews because in the second destruction of the temple, and when we went into to, to, uh, uh, east of uh, Israel, the language that was spoken by the nations were Arabic, and they used to call us Bnei Yehuda. The sons of Yehuda. So it was uh, distorted into Yehudi. But even though I know there's an argument by saying about Mordechai, Ish Yehudi Aya, we're not going to get into the argument why we're called Jews, why we're called Yehudim. But we're called the sons of Israel, Bnei Israel. Yaakov was the head of our, our entire nation. All our nation came out from the tribes. Very soon Mashiach is going to come and he's going to start pointing out which tribe are we from. Although there's one opinion that says that we're all from the tribe of Yehuda, and some from the tribe of, uh, of, I mean, there's different of opinions. I don't go by any opinion because nobody really knows. When Mashiach is going to come, he's going to start pointing out who's, who's who. And of course, there's different opinions of the lost tribes and so forth. But the point is that we all belong to one father. So the spark of Yaakov Avinu is in every generation. And as that spark will come into the leader of the generation. There's always going to be a nasi, uh, a head of the generation. I need to know how to connect myself to that nasi, to the leader of the generation. And the way of doing it is by humbling myself. Now, more than that, we want to kind of summarize what we're talking about. So we want to concentrate again about Menashe. Menashe has a very unique character trait. And that character trait is that he knows how to, so to say, split in two. When the Menashe got the land, got his piece in the land, he's the only tribe that got two pieces. Everybody got a piece. It's called in Hebrew, Nachala, a, a portion in the land. Menashe is the only tribe that got split in half. One part got the one side of the river, that's called the east side of the river. This is called in the land of Gilad, and it's on the other side of the Jordan. It's not in the land of Israel. But this land was conquered by Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu conquered it from a king called Og, the king of the, of the Bashan. And this is called Eretz HaGilad. So part of the tribe got a piece over there, and another piece got east from the river, and this is positioned, again, in an <laughs> ironic way, under Ephraim. So Ephraim is above. But we see that he got two portions. Now, if you remember, there are two other tribes that didn't want to go into Eretz Israel, Reuven and Gad, and they asked for a portion outside of Israel because they said this is a good land for us to, for our flocks and sheep and everything. Now, in that, in, in that separation, Reuven and Gad, they got a piece in that land, and a piece, a, a portion of the tribe of Gad, of uh, Menashe, also got that. You know, the difference is Reuven and Gad asked for it. They came to Moshe Rabbein and said, we want this land. We like the real estate. We like the view. They were right. They got the land where Syria is. Syria and Lebanon, go visit there, Bezad Hashem, soon Mashiach is going to come, you see what a beautiful land it is. My parents, my father is from Lebanon, his grandparents from Syria, they said it's one of the most beautiful lands, full of waterfalls and forests, and Bezad Hashem, this is ours, David the Melech conquered it. Is that part of Israel? It's part of our borders, yes, yeah. Syria and, 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 and Lebanon and part of Turkey and Iraq, if you look at the biblical yeah. uh, borders we have, Israel is huge. So Yehuda, eh, Reuven, and God, they demanded and asked for Moshe Rabbeinu, give us this piece of the land. Menashe didn't say anything. Moshe says, I want to give you. 
and he gave a piece of the land. Menashe has another amazing character trait. There is a very bad character trait that is called Ta'avat Mamon. The lust, the improper lust for money. That I, I constantly want to go after money all the time. And only that, I'm jealous with other people's money. Constantly. Menashe didn't have that. Whatever you want to give me, I'm good. Some of the tribes were demanding what they want. Menashe was like, whatever you give me, I'm fine. Whatever you give me is good. You know, there's a story in the Torah about a certain individual. His name, his name is Tzlofchad. And he has a few daughters that came and demanded a, a place. Bnot Tzlofchad. They said, it's not fair. We're not getting any position of the land because we don't have any brothers and our father is dead. They're descendants of Menashe. And Menashe... Again, he didn't care. Whatever you want to give me, you give me. I don't care. So we see, based on many other facts, but like I told you before, there is a very special connection between Moshe and Menashe. Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, actually came to Menashe and gave him the Nachala. He says, I want you to have this portion. If you remember before, we mentioned that Moshe and Menashe are both the younger brothers. And, and then we have Ephraim and Aaron that are older brothers. Moshe has a very special connection with Menashe. The only difference between Moshe and Menashe is the letter Nun. This is the letter Nun. Moshe has the Mem, the Shin and the He. And Menashe, you just add, add the Nun. That's the difference between Moshe and Menashe. Now, believe it or not, in the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges in the Tanakh, the name of Moshe Rabbeinu is appearing as the name Menashe. When the, the grandson was sinning, it's talking about the Yehonatan, Ben Gershom, Ben Menashe. Gershom is the father of, Menashe, of Moshe. So we see in the Tanakh one time that the name of Moshe is added and we read it as Menashe. So at some point in the Tanakh, Moshe's name is mentioned with a nun. We see that in many places in the Tanakh that, for example, Yaakov sometimes will be written with a Vav, without a Vav, and some of the names are written with a certain letter or without a letter. Moshe Rabbeinu is one of the most common names in the Torah, probably mentioned the most in the Torah, and only in the plant place in the Tanakh that can be found in the book of Judges, Shoftim, the name of Moshe is mentioned as Menashe. Now what is this Nun? We mentioned before the noon, remember? The noon represents the nefilah, the falling, the depression, the bitterness, and so forth. The noon represents what's called Shara Nun, the 50th gate of Bina. Moshe Rabbeinu was able to receive in his life 49 gates. And the 50th gate he only received when he passed on. When he went on the mountains, it says, where did he go? On Har Nevo. What's Har Nevo? Har is a mountain. Nevo is Nun Bo. Inside it is the Nun. So Moshe Rabbeinu got the 50th gate, Shar Nun, when he died. When he was alive, he got 49 gates. Menashe is hinting about the Shar Nun, because he has the Nun. Moshe doesn't have the Nun, and Menashe has the Nun. Which means that Moshe, that uh, Menashe, is representing the 50th gate, the Shara Nun, what Moshe Rabbeinu could not get while he was alive. So Menashe, even though Menashe actually comes before Moshe, but Menashe is, uh, he will see a hint here that Menashe got two portions in the land of Israel. One of them is so to say af before the river, and one of them is after the river. The portion that what Moshe Rabbeinu didn't get, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't get into Israel. And he's a levy, he's not going to get a portion. But Menashe, the connection, is the noon that Menashe has, is representing the portion of Moshe Rabbeinu that he never got while he was alive, both in the Shara Nun and in the possession in the land. So we see that Moshe and Menashe has a very special connection, which of course we spoke about before, the Nasi, the head of the generation that starts from Moshe Rabbeinu. He was the head, he was the Nasi. Now, Moshe wanted to separate the land in such a way to give a portion to Menashe, knowing that Menashe is going to be holding him for him, the Shara Nun. And the Nun represents that who, who got the Nun at the end is Yoshua bin Nun. Yoshua that took the leadership after Moshe Rabbeinu, 
and took the Bnei Israel into Eretz Israel, his name is Yoshua bin Nun. So the, the hint here of the Nun is that the one that got the Nun from Moshe Rabbeinu was Yoshua. Now, really, Moshe Rabbeinu was missing that Shar Nun while he was alive. Yeah, he got it while after he left. But he was missing it while he was alive. This Shar Nun is concealed, is Genuz for Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu is going to come very soon, the first two people, I don't know if to call them people, the first two tzaddikim that Mashiach is going to bring with him is Moshe and Aaron. When Mashiach is going to come, Moshe is going to be on one side and Aaron is going to be on the other side. Aaron is going to have to teach all the Kohanim what to do and Moshe is going to have to teach everybody the Torah. Well, we're chick -chack. We gotta, gotta get the show on the road. Mm -hmm. Mashiach is going to come with two bodyguards, Moshe and Aaron. Then he's going to have to come here at Tzfat and start working everybody up. This is not a myth. Mashiach is going to come through Tzfat and he's going to start waking up. There's about 2,000 sages around us. We're going to start picking them all up. We're going to need them. So we're going to have a little big party here. You better prepare your clothes. So... Yeah, I mean, there are two levels in Triat Emetim. The first one is right when Mashiach comes. We don't know exactly who, who is going to enliven. But right when Mashiach comes, there's going to be a partial Triat Emetim. And we know for sure Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron, and we don't know exactly who, but could very much be. He's going to pass here and pick everybody up, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and, and the Ari, and who, you know who's buried around here in the, in the 30 kilometer diameter from us. And the, the, the majority of the pillars of the Jewish nations are here. And the, in the, if you take a diameter of 30 kilometers around us, everywhere you'll go, throw, throw a rock, you'll find a grave. So obviously there's something going on here. Don't worry, everybody will know. Eliyahu Navi, Eliyahu Navi is going to blow the shofar and everybody know. You know now Rabbi Kanievsky, one of the greatest rabbis in our generation, came out with uh, an instruction, uh, with uh, 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 instructions what to do. And he says, Don't, if some people will uh, kind of freak out when they hear the shofar. And you know, you have to say Shechianu, there's another blessing that you have to say. And, and yeah, he says, don't get alarmed. You're going to hear the shofar. This is not a regular shofar. The whole world is going to shake. Wow. So don't worry. You'll know when Mashiach is coming. The sky is going to become very bright. Wow. So you're going to get a WhatsApp message. He's here. Don't worry. So just to conclude our class, we mentioned in the beginning that the sense of the month is the sense of smelling, which is nogea. It's corresponding to our to our neshama, to our breathing. Again, I breathe through my nose, but the sense is very sensitive. And we said, we just mentioned about Mashiach, how Mashiach is going to come and he's going to be judging by the sense of smell. But really what we want to summarize for the class and what I want to focus on the entire month is the attributes that Menashe is possessing. He represents the month, he's the tribe that represents the month, and he represents all these attributes being very happy with my portion, not to have any ego, to be very happy with somebody else's portion, not to have any desire and lust after finance or money. You know, when you run after money, then you don't get anything. When you don't run after the money, that's when the money comes to you. You know, Rabbi Akiva is the ultimate example. He was a, a, a homeless a, 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 a person. He had zero money. The entire years when he was with his wife, they lived in a tent on the street, sleeping on, on hay. For 40 years, they were poor as nothing, as hell. After he became who he was, when he became the, the, the leader, everybody just threw their money on him. His father-in-law that originally totally uh, uh, marked him out, who was a billionaire, Kalba Savoa, all his money threw at him. So when, he, when you run after money, the money doesn't come to you. If you go run away from money, it will come to you. So Menashe has unbelievable character traits that they represent the month. That's why the month is no holidays, there's no events. To symbolize humbleness. You don't need to have the hoo-ha. Be simple. Humble yourself and mainly work on your character trait of being very happy and thankful and grateful with your portion. Don't look around. What does my neighbor has? Look what you have, what Hashem gave you and be thankful. Menashe, kol neshama, 
Hallelujah. You want to praise Hashem? You want to be the ones that praising Hashem? Can only come when the Neshama is humbled. And when you are grateful and you are admitting, Oh Hashem, I'm thank you. And I admit, you're smarter than me. You're richer than me. You're more pretty than me. You're more uh, uh, talented than me. I'm good in this and that. And you are amazing in many other things. Most people look at other people, they judge them and they say, No, I'm much better than anything. Very hard for us to look at another person and say, See, unbelievable musician and such an artist and such a great cook and such a great mother and such a great uh, individual. So we want to take all these character traits as Menashe is representing and apply them only because now it's an auspicious month to really work on that. I'm not occupied by holidays where usually a holiday Everybody's dressed with beautiful clothes. It's very easy to be jealous. Everybody's, you know, showing off. Oh, my etog costs 500 shekels. No, everything is calm. No holidays, no competition. This is the energy I want to tap into. Is to be very happy and grateful with what I have and to see what I have in my life and to thank Hashem for that. Now, if I'm able to do that, you know what I will get in a very indirect way? Menashe represents the Shah Anun. It's a very high level that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't even get while he was alive. And Menashe, that noon, yes, you can look at it as a very negative letter going down and representing an Nefilah, but it can also represent the Shah Anun, an elevation way above nature, an elevation we saw. I told you before that the word Menashe and the word Shmone, eight, same letters. And again, it's representing above the nature. Not to be jealous, not to be judgmental and to be happy with what you have, that's above nature. Because my nature is to be jealous and to look at other places and compare. So this is the month that it seems like a negative month, but it actually has the potential to have the best month to pull out the best character traits out of me, to be able to elevate me to a very high spiritual level. Zat HaMashem should have a beautiful blessed month. After that comes the month of Kislev, a very special happy month. So we have a lot of work to, to do. Mother Shem should have a beautiful, beautiful and successful month.